All right, everyone, we're about to get started. You can take your seats and quiet down a bit. All right, so I want to do a brief introduction, this by, um, which by no means gives um, justice to all the work that Dr. Rhoda has done. So Dr. Alex Rhoda is the Chief of Division of Pediatric Critical Care and the Lynn Salata Family Chair in Pediatric Critical Care and Emergency Medicine at University Hospitals Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. His special interests include pediatric critical care, cardiac critical care, mechanical ventilation, and acute lung injury. A native of Brazil, Dr. Rhoda earned his undergraduate degree in chemistry and doctorate in medicine in Brazil. He completed a pediatrics residency at Wayne State Children's Hospital of Michigan in Detroit, where he did a chief resident year in his final year of training. He completed his fellowship at pediatric critical care, a fellowship in pediatric critical care at the Children's Hospital of Buffalo in New York, um, in New York and Dr. Rhoda has held several appointments in assistant professor uh, in pediatrics, emergency medicine, and anesthesiology before joining university hospitals in 2013. He is currently a professor of pediatrics at Case Western Reserve University. He has authored and co-authored more than two dozen textbook chapters and nearly 150 papers and abstracts in peer-reviewed journals, primarily on mechanical ventilation in infants and children. He is also a reviewer for many of the leading medical journals in his field and has frequently been invited as a presenter at medical meetings and symposia across the U.S. and internationally, including Beijing and his home, Brazil. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rhoda. Thank you, Megan, for the uh, very kind and uh, uh, more lengthy than I deserve introduction. It's a pleasure to be here uh, um, with you, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, that Megan brought up that I am a native of Brazil for several reasons. Uh, one, it will disclose uh, um, uh, up front a conflict of interest that will become obvious uh, in the next few slides. Second is uh, we've had a very, very rough past 30 hours in the uh, ICU, and I get very, um, my accent comes out very heavily, and I slur when I'm sleep deprived, so I apologize in advance. So as Megan pointed out, I made uh, you know, my career in mechanical ventilation, acute lung injury, and, uh, and it has nothing to do with this. So. Uh, I'm kind of an accidental um, um, uh, expert in in-flight uh, medical events, and uh, it all started about oh, maybe 12 years ago now uh, when I was stuck in an elevator. And I was stuck in an elevator in a most inauspicious place. I was the only intensivist at uh, a children's hospital in uh, Texas, and I had a relatively fresh Norwood uh, post-operative child, which is a very unstable neonate post-heart surgery. Um, and there I was, you know, stuck in the, cell, in the elevator uh, by myself. That was not a picture of it. There's several people there. Uh, but it got me thinking, it's, number one, how can I get out of this? Number two is, uh, uh, although we have all the medical care in the ICU right now, the one person who should be in it, uh, leading that effort is stuck in the elevator. So it got me thinking of situations where um, you can't get to medical care or medical care can't get to you. Um, so one of those places is uh, up in the air. And uh, I'm sure you recognize this uh, um, uh, gentleman. Uh, these are the uh, Wright brothers. Um, in 1903, uh, they flew this aircraft. Uh, and they are considered by those in this country uh, the fathers of aviation. Now, that's when the Brazilian disclosure comes through because for the rest of the world, they are not. Uh, and uh, this is the guy who is um, uh, credited as being the father of aviation, whose name is Alberto Santos Dumont. Uh, Santos Dumont um, uh, was the um, uh, winner of the um, aviation prize. You know, back then in the 1900s, the pioneers, they would say, well, if you circumnavigate the globe in a balloon, that's, you know, the X prize or whatever prize. And so these pioneers would, uh, would have challenges extended. And, uh, and Santos Dumont was a, a, a flight enthusiast. You know, in the early 1900s, he would fly around Paris in his uh, uh, dirigible, uh, and that's him uh, going around the Eiffel Tower uh, as part of a leg of one of such challenges. Uh, but uh, uh, Santos Dumont uh, was contemporaneous to the Rice Brothers and, and uh, uh, accepted the challenge. And the challenge involved flying, uh, observed by several witnesses, a machine heavier than air that took, uh, took off on its own power, 
flew for a certain distance, maneuvered, and landed. Um, now, this happened in 1906, and you might say, well, you know, the Rice Brothers were flying in 1903, and that is correct. But you'll also notice that uh, there's a track here. You know, this, uh, this device was catapulted uh, uh, to be airborne, and um, the Parisian flight uh, uh, that uh, was won by Santos Dumont uh, required two consecutive flights, which meant that you had to land, and your machine had to be um, um, uh, well enough to operate for a second flight. And if you read the descriptions of the Wright brothers, uh, their flights usually uh, ended in, and then it will take about a week to fix the uh, flying machine, uh, and then they will go at it again. So. Um, no bias on my part, but uh, uh, I think that this is a guy that you should know. This is the most famous person you did not know. He's also, by the way, if you are a watch enthusiast, um, uh, Santos' uh, uh, best friend was uh, Mr. Cartier. And uh, Santos Dumont needed a watch to be able to time his uh, airborne time. And uh, it was very cumbersome to have uh, his pocket watch. So he commiserated with uh, Mr. Cartier, who said, you know what, I have a solution for you. We'll strap something on your wrist, and hence the uh, wristwatch was born. And to this day, uh, Cartier has a collection called the Santos Cartier, uh, which is uh, in homage to Santos Dumont. But enough about, uh, about uh, uh, patriotism. Uh, Santos Dumont uh, and the Rice Brothers introduced aviation to the world, uh, and it really took off, no pun intended. If you can see here, the number of enplanements, uh, and that is the number of passengers that boarded a plane, uh, from 1970 to 19, sorry, for, to 1970 to 2014, you can see a very uh, a rapid rise. And uh, uh, for the first time this year, uh, we are projected to break 3.5 billion enplanements a year. Uh, so it's, it's a massive amount uh, of, uh, of air traffic. Uh, just for, for reference, uh, the Earth's population uh, grew 67% between 1980 and 2014, uh, and the number of employments grew 364%. So there is not only a better availability, but a democratization of, uh, of air travel. Uh, this is really a heat map of uh, air traffic in the world, and it's, it's very telling. It, it, it tells you about uh, um, income, it tells you about desirable places to go, and you can clearly see hot spots in uh, North America, Europe, uh, Moscow, this is mostly uh, uh, the president's plane um, here, China, uh, and, uh, and artificial hubs like uh, Abu Dhabi and Dubai uh, that really draw a lot of air traffic, um, consolidating themselves as, uh, uh, as an alternative economic source uh, because one day fossil fuel will go away. It has never been so easy as it is now to travel by air. You know, we have bigger planes that carry more people, longer routes that were unimaginable before, um, so people are spending more time in the air than ever before. Just for, for the sake of the exercise, at any given time, there are 5 million people up in the air, 5 million people in the world, which means it's a, it's a city the size of a large metropolitan area up in the air. So can you imagine a city the size of, I don't know, Houston, um, uh, one single day? and nothing bad is going to happen? No, many things happen. You know, people will have heart attacks. People will have syncopal episodes. They will have seizure breakthroughs uh, and everything in between. So you now have to consider uh, the fact that people are everywhere up in the air and things are bound to happen. There are some things uh, about air travel that make um, medical events uh, a little more likely to occur in flight than uh, in, uh, on land. Uh, for one, uh, as soon as you board an aircraft, uh, and if you spend long, you know, it, it, enough time in it, uh, you'll notice that you'll have mucosal dryness. The, the um, uh, aircraft uh, cabin air is not fully conditioned. It doesn't have uh, the humidity that you will encounter in most places in this country uh, at sea level. Um, the availability of drinks, now that uh, the, the glamorous days of air travel for those who don't fly business or first class are gone. So you're lucky if you have you know, a small amount of water you know, during your journey as your insensible losses are, are higher. Um, there are changes in cabin pressure. You, know, you might have uh, you know, sinus issues, uh, uh, middle ear issues. Um, cabin environment has a lower um, oxygen concentration. So you will have 
uh, hypoxia. And that is probably the most compelling point about jet lag. It's not changes in time zones. It is actually um, how you feel after being uh, uh, in a hypoxic environment for as long as it will take you to get to your destination. Because uh, those who travel east-west are just as likely to be jet lagged as those who travel north-south, which I happen to do a lot uh, going to South America. When you are uh, inside of uh, uh, an aircraft, uh, that very mild hypoxia that you experience will lead to a very mild degree of hyperventilation. Uh, and to some people, uh, those who are more sensitive, you might actually have symptoms who uh, resemble those of altitude sickness with a little hyperventilation, uh, hypocapnia, and uh, uh, cerebral vasoconstriction. Um, so then all those um, contribute to uh, the occurrence of some medical event, either a manifestation of a new event or an exacerbation of something that uh, you had as a pre-existing condition. And now you are in a confined space, crowded conditions. You have decreased mobility, which can be um, a, a problem and also a genesis for, for medical problems, such as you know, pulmonary embolism, thrombosis. Um, you cannot underestimate white noise. Uh, the noise inside of a cabin is, uh, is, is, is deafening from, a, from an, a, a, an accuracy standpoint. So you're, you're your hearing acuity uh, becomes really um, um, uh, harmed. And, and for those of you who have ever tried to auscultate someone on a plane, you know what I'm talking about. In fact, just a show of hands, how, how many of you have been on a flight uh, where you were called or someone was called uh, f because of a medical emergency? Just show your hands. So about a third of the room. Uh, and, and, and I would say that's, uh, that's about right statistically. So I love when, when, when things work like that. So not only you have this white noise, but you also have you know, dim lights, you have limited resources, uh, and most importantly, even under the best circumstances, you have delayed uh, access to definitive care. So if someone is having a stroke in front of you on the airplane and you know exactly what you need to do to address that, because you do, uh, you are still at best, if everything is perfect, at least 30 minutes away uh, from land and probably another 30 minutes from the hospital. So uh, that poses uh, obviously a, a problem. Uh, at cruising altitude, uh, planes uh, have various uh, um, uh, altitudes, but usually they operate somewhere between 32 and 43,000 feet, mostly in the mid to high 30s. Um, you would think that uh, modern aircraft will have you know, a pressurized cabin, and they do, because obviously you could not fly at 32,000 feet uh, and breathe rarefied air. So you have to pressurize the cabin, but what most people fail to understand is that the cabin is not pressurized to sea level. The cabin is pressurized to about six to 8,000 feet. So that will be you know, the height of Mexico City, for instance. And you say, well, people live in, Me in Mexico City and there's no problem. Yes, but they don't go from sea level you know, within 15 minutes and they are at that altitude. So changes in cabin pressures cannot be underestimated. And most importantly, if your alveolar PO2 at sea level is approximately 100 a torr, uh, at cruising altitude is about 72, 64 torr. So if you happen to have some um, you know, diffusion limitation, if you happen to have some chronic lung disease, certainly if you're oxygen dependent uh, or have pulmonary hypertension, you can expect uh, some um, a physiologic change uh, even in modern pressurized aircraft. Um, we've known for, for years that, uh, uh, that there are physiologic changes during flight. Um, most of them are minor, and of course my interest is in uh, pediatrics, so uh, these are a couple of pediatric studies, one of which um, essentially just followed um, uh, pulse oximetry uh, for children in flight and showed that uh, um, at cruising altitude and uh, especially during um, sleep, uh, children become hypoxemic, not profoundly hypoxemic, but they will change their saturation from 95 to 97 percent to about uh, 89, 91 percent. Um, it is the equivalent of breathing 15 percent FiO2 on land, just so you have an idea of that. Uh, and in fact, uh, that cannot be underestimated. Uh, the second study that I show here is a, it's a very controversial study from the uh, British Medical Journal, where um, uh, researchers took children uh, who were uh, uh, siblings of children who died of sudden infant death syndrome, and a postulated mechanism was hypoventilation hypoxia leading to SIDS. So these now vulnerable parents who you know, have you know, a dog in the fight uh, volunteer their infant children to undergo this experiment where they were exposed uh, to um, uh, a chamber uh, with 15% oxygen and uh, were allowed to become quite desaturated 
uh, to the point where um, uh, would really simulate uh, air travel. Uh, and um, some of them, and it was quite unpredictable, uh, would have a derangement of their um, uh, uh, breathing regulation and will have um, uh, breathing pauses and acceleration and uh, um, things that might be uh, tied to, in some patients, uh, sudden infant death. I'm going to make this you know, quite, quite informal, and I think uh, uh, what, what I should probably do is tell you some stories. Because uh, I got interested in this not just because of the elevator and the no access to, to health care or health care provider, uh, but also because it was kind of a lightning rod for, for a medical uh, event. Um, there is the febrile irritable model ch the child. It was my, the first time I was called to, to see someone. I was like, well, you know, I'm right at home. I'm a pediatric intensivist. This is a febrile child, and here I am. No problem. Well, big problem. Okay, first of all, uh, it is very different. You cannot underestimate you know, your home field advantage, uh, and nothing is like that in the air. Um, I have no equipment. I have no lights. I have uh, a very irritable child. I cannot tell what is what. And, of course, in my world, uh, if you are a febrile model, you're probably going to die of sepsis. Uh, and, of course, the child had nothing you know, of that. It was an irritable febrile child that probably had some, some otitis media. Uh, but even, even someone who takes care of you know, sick children for a living, uh, I had a great deal of difficulty discerning, you know, is this the kid that's going to do me in and going to be on the front page of the New York Times by being the intensivist that could not, you know, take care of this uh, anesthetic child. Turned out that the child got some uh, uh, antipyretic and defravast over the next hour or so, but it, it just gives you a, a, an idea of uh, how, how different things are uh, up in the air. You know, we had the intoxicated anesthesiologist and the ruptured uh, uh, ovarian cyst. We had a suicidal Englishman. This was a flight from, um, um, from New York to London. And um, they asked for a medical volunteer, and um, I raised my hand. And I was ushered to the back of the plane where there was this um, young man who, who was uh, you know, vomiting profusely and shaking. Uh, he was also um, uh, very bruised. He had been assaulted uh, prior to boarding the flight. And, and the um, uh, flight attendant said that he... Um, was trying to kill himself, and he was trying to kill others by opening the um, uh, plane door. Um, and he was sitting right by the door. Uh, and you know, to some, this might seem counterintuitive, but uh, uh, if you're flying a, a, a 777, if you've ever seen how those doors work, you know, they, they, they come in sideways, and then they, they, in a very specific way, they come into the plane, and then they go out of the plane. So you really can't open the door because any small pressure differential, and there is a great pressure differential between the inside and the outside of the aircraft, you will have to pull that door against that pressure differential. And by rough calculations, it's about four ton that you have to pull back. So there's no way someone is going to open the door in flight. So if that's what he's going to be obsessed about, so be it. But uh, but uh, turns out, uh, you know, this young man had had flown to New York to to be with his boyfriend, who then turned on him and assaulted him and stole all his money and all his heroin. And now he was flying back home, uh, uh, having withdrawal symptoms and being homicidal and suicidal. So I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, but I, I know enough to not antagonize someone like that and, uh, and, and let him play with the door, but also made a, made a, made a pact with him, because I've seen my you know, psych, psych, uh, psychiatry attendants do that, where you'll have a contract with this person that he's not gonna harm himself or me or anyone around him, and then things are going to be okay. Um, so she was already going to be like, yeah, it's going to be fine. Just don't do anything silly. We're going to be fine. We're going to land in two hours. So we landed, and uh, the, it turns out uh, it's frowned upon when you try to take the plane down by opening the door. And uh, the uh, captain essentially said, we landed. Please stay seated. Uh, and then the uh, British SWAT came in and wrestled this guy out, and he was just looking at me like, our contract, is that why? <laughs> there's, there's nothing I can do, <laughs> you know, it's out of my hands. Um, but, uh, so I don't know how that turned out. Uh, even the simpler, uh, simplest things to, to you, you know, the, the overweight gentleman with chest pain. Well, here, you know, you run an EKG, you send a troponin, and you go to the next patient. Up in the air, you know, did he have bad sushi, or is he really having a heart attack, and do we have to get this plane down? or can we continue to destination? Um, the, the most um, um, uncomfortable I, I, I've ever been on a plane was with the ethnic lady. Uh, I was flying from um, uh, uh, Newark to Lisbon, 
And uh, my wife and I had already spotted the very inconvenient and intoxicated anesthesiologist at the gate, who is number two, who then became part of this uh, uh, tragic comedy. Uh, the uh, apneic lady, uh, we were called uh, because someone was having difficulty breathing. And uh, I went you know, a few rows back, and there was this lady that difficulty breathing meant not breathing. And she was pretty cyanotic and completely apneic. Uh, and, and she was, you know, as luck would have it, in the middle seat uh, with no family members. So you have no idea of what this maybe 60-something-year-old woman, uh, what her past history is. All you know is she boarded this plane, and now she's not breathing. So we immediately you know, lifted her up and took her to the front of the plane. Um, and uh, you know, the galley is actually a pretty good place to give first aid, um, except that you still have white noise and uh, vibration and poor lighting. So I assess patients every day, and I could not tell if this woman was breathing or not later, you know, within a few seconds, found out she was not, or whether she had a pulse or not, because the vibration of the plane makes it very hard. Auscultation without a stethoscope, very, very hard. So then you ask for the medical kit, and the um, uh, flight attendant brings this thing that looks like a little toiletry, and it had uh, a tourniquet, some gauze, and, uh, and some tape, and an aspirin. And I said, well, no, 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 I'm talking like the, the real medical kit. Uh, so for your information, there are different layers of medical kits on the plane. There is a medical kit when you need a Band-Aid. There's a medical kit when you need a medical kit, uh, and we'll go over the contents of that. And then there is an equipment and medicine uh, kit. Uh, and some planes have very developed uh, um, um, uh, levels of support, and we'll get to that in a second. So the ethnic lady wasn't, wasn't breathing. No one would claim her. Uh, eventually, after some time, someone said, you know, she was sitting next to her. She was going to Portugal because her ex-husband died, and she was very nervous. I saw she take some medication. So we go there, and she had taken quite a bit of diazepam. Um, so now you know, we know what you're dealing with, uh, but you still have an ethnic person on a plane. And by the way, there are no endotracheal tubes on a plane because that would have been very easy. So you have to bag this person. Uh, and, <laughs> and then there are some things that you, know, you, you, you read on the news. A few months ago, there was a lot of, there was a big uproar about uh, a young lady who is an emergency medicine physician uh, in Michigan uh, who was not allowed to provide medical care or kept being challenged uh, when she stepped up to provide medical care uh, because they wouldn't believe she was a physician. Um, I think that that's one slant of it. I can tell you that uh, you know, I was going to a medical conference, I acted like a physician, I looked like a physician, and as soon as I went to get an IV on the apneic lady, someone said, stop, you cannot do that. You need to prove you are a physician. Show me your license. And I said, well, as, as every physician probably told you, every time you ask this question, no one carries a license. Um, <laughs> but by then, um, you know, you have... You're, you're doing this in front of your three, 300 of your closest friends. So now there is a mob mentality that let him work, let the guy work, let him do his thing. Uh, and then it dawned on me that uh, I actually have you know, my, my business card uh, uh, in my wallet. And you know, I will get my wallet from my back pocket, and you'll see there is a card. And then they were satisfied by my, by my, uh, my professional card. I think that they thought either he is a physician or he's a very, very committed con man. Either way, <laughs> we are going to you know, let him work. But uh, you can't underestimate the, the, the difficulty of taking care of someone like that. And, and fortunately for me, there was a, a, a medic from Jersey uh, who was also on this flight. And, um, and I said, well, you know, this is your natural habitat. Like you take care of people on your knees in difficult environments every day, and I don't. And he told me, you are still going to be the one getting the one angel cat into this one vein that she has, because if I screw this up, you know, it's on me. So, well, can you do it? No, you're going to do it. So... Fortunately, you know, we got an IV on her. She was profoundly hypotensive. There was a gastroenterologist uh, um, uh, from Texas who approached and said, I don't know anything you guys are doing, but I can take a blood pressure with a stigma manometer. <laughs> so he was on blood pressure detail every yeah. two minutes and just, you know, <laughs> six is over 20s, seven is over 30s. So we located an IV bag of saline. We located another IV bag and an ampule of epinephrine, and we mixed the two together, and we put it on this lady. And then the captain, um, uh, the flight attendant asked, the captain is inquiring whether or not we need to divert. And then I said, well, uh, I, I think this qualifies as that. And then she just kind of rolled her eyes because she obviously <laughs> looked at me and said, well, you don't realize that you are three hours into a six and a half hour flight to Portugal in the middle of the Atlantic and there is no place to divert. 
So um, the captain then comes back and says, well, we can go three hours to Lisbon or two and a half hours to the Azores. Uh, and, and I'm thinking, well, if in two and a half hours are in this predicament, it's not going to be the half hour that's going to, you know, to change things. So let's reassess as we go. So we bagged this woman uh, after a fluid bolus and Trendelenburg and liver compression, and we didn't start the epinephrine. We bagged her for about an hour, and then she started having some spontaneous breath and, and, and recovered. Uh, entered the intoxicated anesthesiologist, who then barges in, <laughs> fumbling over everyone. And says, oh, you just have to give her some flumazenil. So, <laughs> of course, why didn't I think of that? Um, do you have any? No, I, I don't. Uh, so. It is important that you familiarize yourself with what's available in the aircraft because people are sometimes not very forthcoming with that. Um, so you will have oropharyngeal airways, so the Goodell type airways, just to kind of keep the tongue out of the way. There is some tape, sponges, CPR mask, uh, if you are uh, inclined to do mouth to mouth. Uh, there are one or two angiocaths, uh, some needles, gloves, the sigma manometer stethoscope, uh, syringes, uh, scissors, tourniquet, uh, and uh, ambu bag with three size masks, uh, the smallest of which is too big for an infant. Uh, instructions on how to use the kit, which I think should have come first. Uh, you have non-narcotic analgesics, antihistamines, aspirin, atropine, bronchodilators, dextrose, epinephrine, lidocaine, nitroglycerin, and, solution, and uh, saline solution. So if you are an adult who is dehydrated or is having a mild heart attack, um, that's probably a, a, a friendly uh, setup. If you are a child and you have a seizure disorder, you're really out of luck if you don't have your own medication. There are, so this is what the FAA requires um, planes that fly with an American flag to have. And, and, and if you know, uh, a plane has, you know, once the door is closed and a plane is uh, um, up in the air, the plane follows the laws of the parent country. So if you're flying American Airlines, you're going to answer to the FAA. If you're flying um, Qantas, uh, you're going you're to answer to um, uh, Australian authorities, even though you might be at the, on the tarmac at JFK. So there are many nuances to this, and this is what the FAA uh, requires, and it's matched by most airlines in the world. There's also an enhanced medical kit, and not every airline has it. It's a voluntary um, setup. And there are burn dressings and cord clamps and scalpels and the tracheal tubes, uh, tracheal catheters, uh, laryngoscopes, strips, thermometers, uh, Foley catheters. And then this is where it gets high maintenance because now you have to start protecting these drugs and you have to start uh, replacing drugs such as diazepam, morphine, and naloxone, uh, and um, uh, beta blockers. So, of course, narcotics and, and, and sedatives, highly controlled, and, uh, and so the airlines don't like to carry that because they have to keep track of, uh, of, uh, uh, of this inventory. But anyway, um, I make it a point now to familiarize myself with which airline I'm flying. I usually fly a, a U.S. flag airline, uh, but the regulations are, 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 are very different. Uh, I became quite interested in, um, in, in in-flight events and try to get data. And it's, as I can find out, it's quite difficult because if you call United Airlines, they say, you know, we don't keep this data. And, and even if they did, they would not share it with you because it's very bad for business. Um, you know, the airlines want to create an image that uh, everything is uh, hunky-dory up in the air. And the last thing they want is you know, press about medical issues. So then I thought, well, let me use my, my Brazilian influence. I'm a, an Air Force Reserve person. I, have, I was a pilot. I have uh, contacts. And... You know, sure enough, uh, someone is going to be interested. So you start the conversation of doing research with data from airlines in your home country, and it's a very, very good conversation stopper when you tell them exactly what you want, which is um, you know, serious in-flight medical events, deaths on air, uh, and things that could have gone better. So no go there. As I was doing this in uh, 2013, this paper came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this is what I think is the comprehensive adult uh, uh, paper on in-flight uh, emergencies. And uh, this is something that I, I expect many of you um, would be familiar with. Uh, they studied uh, just under 12,000 in-flight medical events, um, which is about 16 per 1 million passenger lives covered, uh, or one in-flight event for every about 600 flights. So your chance of being um, involved in a medical event is 
depending on who you read, between one in 300 or one in 600 flights. So you can see how um, there might be a little of a lightning rod effect when, when I've been involved with, uh, with nearly a dozen. Uh, and that sparked my interest. There was a broad range of ages, uh, and in this particular study, aircraft diversion happened in just over 7%. Now, aircraft diversion is a big deal for the airlines. Number one, you're going to land in a place where you do not intend to land. Number two, you can't land heavy. So if you are, you know, start your flight and you have a full tank of fuel, you have to dump the fuel before you land. Uh, and, um, um, and then the displacement, the aircraft is not supposed to be there. It is expected that a diversion will cost somewhere between fifty and hundred thousand dollars for the airline. So, so they are very invested in number one, not diverting. Number two, only diverting when it's really necessary. Um, this is a, a, a busy uh, table from this study, but it just gives you an idea of what um, your comfort zone up in the air would be, because these are mostly adults that are having events, and uh, so you should expect to see. Uh, syncope and presyncope, respiratory symptoms, nausea and vomiting, cardiac symptoms, seizures, abdominal pain, and uh, you know, mostly fever and, and, and diarrhea. Uh, serious complications such as cardiac arrest happen very rarely. So out of nearly 12,000 events, uh, only 38 cardiac arrest situations. But most of the, most of the deaths happen uh, from cardiac arrest. So if you arrest uh, up in the air and you're an adult, um, Odds are not in your favor. Uh, of course, syncope or presyncope also had some deaths, which were probably either uh, severe arrhythmias or cardiac arrest was miscategorized. Um, so, but that's your comfort zone. This is what you know, these are the type of patients that you see every day. I, as a pediatrician, uh, would be much more likely to have to to attend to an adult on a flight than a child. You know, uh, children um, encompass about 10% uh, of the flying public. Uh, and um, so as a physician uh, on an airplane, chances are I'm going to be seeing one of these, uh, which is the world you, the world you, you, you transit in. Um, now let's you know, flip this a little bit and, and, and think about how you'd, you would feel taking care of a pediatric emergency. So this study was not good about uh, separating children and adults. Everything was kind of uh, heavy, heavily stacked towards uh, um, adults. And, um, I thought, well, let me reach out to them uh, because they're, um, they were getting data from a ground-based medical support center uh, based at the University of Pittsburgh uh, that provides remote access to medical control or medical support uh, to airlines. And I remember reading this paper that I said, well, we provide, we cover about 10% of the worldwide traffic. Uh, so I said, well, great. You know, they have 12,000 cases. I'll take, you know, 1,000 cases of kids and we can, we can, we can, have a, 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 an exploratory paper. And unfortunately for me, they were not interested. Uh, and and um, so it was, just, you know, I, I was very despondent that day. I'll, I'll never forget it. I, I was driving home and just kind of ruminating as in, you know, what happened to, you know, open access data? What happened to sharing um, um, your database? Um, you know, how, how selfish of them, you know, not to want to explore a different venue. And I was just kind of rereading this paper in my head as I was driving home, and then I had this eureka moment. I said, well, if they cover 10% of the uh, airspace, there is a gorilla that covers a bigger share than that, and I need to find out who this gorilla is. So it turns out uh, there is no one who covers 90% of the airspace, because China, uh, that accounts for just, uh, just over 30% of the air traffic, uh, does not believe in ground-based medical support. And there are a couple of airlines that have their own system. Uh, uh, Korean Air and KLM uh, have an in-house uh, medical support. But there is a company uh, that provides medical support to about 40% of the worldwide traffic. And the way this works is uh, it's pretty fascinating. They, you, you, are, you are up in the air, medical event happens, a flight crew, uh, either by satellite phone or by radio, um, loops into uh, an operator that is based in Arizona. Uh, inside of a busy level one trauma center. And there are dedicated physicians who are 24 seven dedicated to uh, medical support up in the air. So operator takes the call, they already know which flight it is, who is on that flight, are there registered physicians on that flight, what are the assets, what is the closest diversion point, 
a screen blows up and um, the, 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 the flight is now a single dot as opposed to the thousands of dots that were there before. Um, and you know, what kind of diversion you can have, uh, what kind of assets you have on the ground. So when a physician comes on the phone, uh, they already have all this information, including medications, doses, uh, and the name of the medicines on the uh, whatever idiom uh, is uh, spoken for that flag uh, plane. Um, so you would be amazed how many, how many different names there is for uh, acetaminophen uh, around the world uh, as we go through this database. So I called them up and I said, listen, I'm, I have this burning interest to, to look at data from, from um, uh, in-flight events and you know, I need to talk to someone. So I, I figured out who the medical director was. I called him up and uh, I asked his secretary, you know, can I have his email? Because I, I want to send him an email message and ask for that. He says, absolutely not, you cannot have his email. Um, so I was about to hang up. I says, but he's right here if you want to talk to him. So he passed me to this guy and turns out he um, had seen the New England Journal of Medicine paper and was uh, disappointed because they have 10, 20 fold many more cases than what was presented. And they were saying, we, we're sitting on all these data and we don't have an academic partner. So contracts were drafted, we became partners, and, uh, and that gave me a, a very good window into the world of in-flight medical events. Um, so we decided to then just take on what we know best, which is looking at kids um, uh, and medical events in flight. Uh, and it is about 10% of, uh, of all medical events, so it's a small slice of, uh, of everything that happens up in the air. And there's a little bit of a different profile. You know, kids tend to have more gastrointestinal events, uh, mostly vomiting and diarrhea, uh, high fevers, uh, neurologic events, which are seizures and syncope, allergic reactions, respiratory is a, it's a, it's a quite distant uh, fifth or sixth, uh, ear, nose, and throat, mostly um, uh, ear pain and sinus pain. Then you have trauma. Uh, there's quite a bit of trauma that happens uh, in flight and burns. Uh, and so we thought, uh, uh, well, let's just see you know, what happens. So we took a sample that in, in included 4.7 billion implantments, uh, leading to about 114,000 medical emergencies, of which about 10% were pediatric. Most of those um, didn't require any additional care. So plane, la plane landed, uh, <coughs> patients went home, no problem. Some of them, 20%, were evaluated on site by a physician and then sent, uh, you know, sent home. 3% uh, refused care. Uh, just about 2% had to go to the emergency department. A fraction of a percent had to be admitted. And deaths are very rare. But you know, coming from a critical care perspective, I'm always interested in the extremes of, of presentation. So to me, it made sense to start looking uh, at, at, you know, is there a pattern there? Because obviously, if it takes 4 billion passengers for you to have 14 pediatric deaths, there's no way you can find a pattern. You know, you call airlines and they'll say, we haven't had a death on flight, uh, in, in flight for the last 15, 20 years. These are isolated events, and you have to really, you know, go through vast numbers to try to find something. So this is just a representation of that, all events, some that require in-flight care, uh, small amounts requiring hospital care, diversion is rare, and death is super rare. Uh, there's a slight uh, a preponderance of females uh, compared to males, and when you um, look at what was done in flight, uh, most, you know, 56%, were treated with medication, 13% uh, with oxygen, and uh, uh, just under 4% required a medical equipment. Um, this is uh, pretty intuitive. Uh, most in-flight emergencies uh, happen in international flights and in uh, uh, large aircraft. Again, those are uh, aircraft that cover a longer route, so they're longer uh, time in the air, and they also carry more people, so there's a greater chance that something's going to happen. The usual provider is a crew member, uh, and it's not unless it's something that is beyond the limited training uh, that the crew member has or if the ground-based medical support center uh, suggests that you look for a healthcare professional volunteer that someone is going to uh, ask for volunteers. And then you have physicians, nurses, EMTs, and here you have dentists and psych psychologists and even veterinarians. Um, we did uh, uh, bivariate regressions trying to figure out patterns of what could influence uh, the uh, very important uh, uh, diversion. Uh, and it turns out uh, if you are an infant, uh, there is a, a, a three times the odds that uh, you're going to require diversion. Or if a physician is involved and he'll say, well, you know, is this a, a, 
is it a physician's overcall? Probably not. I think it's, uh, it's mostly because physicians get invited to, uh, to attend uh, or asked to volunteer uh, for the uh, most severe cases. Uh, In-flight duration or flight duration is an interesting one because the longer the flight, the lower the chance you're going to divert. And I think here there is a bias based on these very long flights. They are usually uh, transoceanic or transpolar. So if you are um, flying over the Arctic Circle, um, it doesn't matter that you're having a dire emergency. You cannot divert uh, because there's just no place to land. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the rules of diversion is that the place you are diverting to has to be able to provide um, uh, equal or better uh, medical care than your intended destination. Because you know, if you're flying over Haiti uh, and your plane, you know, something happens on a plane, you probably should not land in Haiti because you know they need your help and not the other way around. Uh, flight time remaining is um, is an interesting variable. So. Um, the, the longer the flight time remaining, you know, the more likely you're going to divert. So if you, are, if you just took off, chances are you can turn around and go back. So we decided to look at this from a critical care and emergency medicine standpoint and said, well, none of these things are preventable except for trauma and burn. So let's see if there's a pattern here. Um, so we took, again, our large sample and uh, looked at patients that suffered trauma or an in-flight injury. So these were healthy patients that boarded a plane and then something happens in flight, uh, a burn, trauma, a fall, a laceration. Uh, and then we looked at, you know, what is the distribution of this? So it turns out uh, trauma is a little bit more uh, common than burns uh, in flight in kids. Um, patients who suffer an injury in flight tend to be younger than your average child. So this goes from 0 to 18. Uh, your average injured child is 3 years old. Uh, and there is an uh, over-representation of lap infants. Now, those of you who have traveled with, uh, with small children know that uh, uh, in the U.S. and most of the world, a two-year-old or younger uh, child does not require uh, their own seat. So you can just carry a six-month-old on a plane, flying at 700 miles an hour, moving in a three-dimensional trajectory, uh, and subjected to turbulence. And yet, you cannot go around the block um, holding your child in the back seat of your car. So there's a great disconnect here, right? Um, so um, studies have been done, and we can get into this if we have time, but uh, uh, to, to show that if you force people to buy a, a seat for a one-year-old, then people wouldn't travel, families wouldn't travel, so they will then take the roads, and the chance of you being killed in a car accident is greater than on a plane. And I think that that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that, that's not a good argument. That's, that's to, you know, to say that... Uh, you know, you are you know, not going to buy a car because you have to have airbags, and airbags made the car expensive. You're going to buy a motorcycle, and then your chance of dying on a motorcycle accident is greater. It, it, it doesn't make sense. But nevertheless, you know, the, the study was invited by the FAA and airlines, and it catered to, to their opinion, and there's an interesting statistical analysis of that. Nevertheless, lap infants are at greater risk for injury. Uh, when... Uh, this is a uh, normal distribution of, uh, of in-flight care, and, and for some reason I don't have it here, but uh, when it's an in-flight injury, uh, physicians uh, get called more often. Um, if you look at uh, injuries versus all other medical events, uh, medical events in general do not need additional care in 70% of the time, but if you have an in-flight injury, you need to be seen by a physician or emergency department or at a hospital uh, about half the time. Now, whether this is the seriousness of the injury or the uh, fear of liability, uh, that's, uh, that, that's something we can't glean from the data set. Uh, but, but clearly, these injuries uh, require additional care. So we looked at uh, the types of injuries that, uh, that were found, and you know, there were burns and contusions and lacerations and closed head injuries and crush injuries, abrasions and amputations. So all these things are happening on the plane, and, and a lot of them are happening to infants who are, trying, who are being carried by an adult. Uh, and if you have a, a 10 kilogram you know, child and uh, a 3G uh, turbulence, this child all of a sudden becomes a 30 kilo child and will fly right out of your hands and will hit you know, the uh, uh, overhead compartment. And the description that we read on this database is just over and over and over um, was being held by parent, turbulence, child falls, or you have a rambunctious two year old that falls in the aisle, cracks the head. Uh, so, uh, we decided to look at the uh, mechanisms, and uh, scalding burn is quite common. Uh, so it turns out it is not a good idea, as you pr 
probably practice in your house. You, know, you, you do not take a hot cup of soup and pass over you know, your infant. Uh, but yes, that happens on the plane every day. Uh, and you know, every once in a while, it falls on the child and you have a scalding burn. Uh, falls, uh, hitting the aircraft, armrest. Armrest is evil. Um, armrest, there are so many injuries from, from armrest because of passenger traffic, uh, the uh, service cart, and all you need is digits, service cart, fracture, amputation, laceration. Uh, so we went through, through all of that, and a, and a, and a number of, uh, of children who were sitting uh, on the aisle seat, and uh, you know when, when, when the plane lands and they say, uh, please be careful as you open the overhead compartment as uh, objects might have moved, that's still a disclaimer because every once in a while some child gets a you know, depressed skull fracture from a laptop that falls uh, when someone opens the uh, um, overhead bin. So after looking at, at these injuries, uh, there are some things that you can do to try to avoid that. And so first of all, these injuries are not frequent. You know, they, they happen in a small proportion of cases, but they are particularly prevalent in unrestrained children, especially left infants, uh, as they are more prone to in-flight injuries. And this is particularly true during hot meal service or turbulence. So flights that have hot meal service or hot coffee or, 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 or hot food, uh, there's a disproportionate amount of burns uh, that will happen in those uh, patients, uh, in, in, in those flights. Uh, and there's, we speculate that um, uh, just as you should not have your child uh, playing around in the back seat of your car as you're driving, uh, that uh, in-flight child restraints might have a role. And this is also a very contentious point. Uh, there is a fight between the FAA and, uh, and the NTSB, uh, the FAA is against child seats, and the NTSB say that you absolutely should have it, and that has not been settled. So now it's, a, it's an option to families to use a, a, a flight-approved uh, child seat, uh, but you cannot use that during takeoff and landing, and that's not because it's, takeoff and landings are safe. Um, what they don't want is any barrier to potential evacuation of a plane and uh, a, a child seat during those vulnerable periods can be seen as that. Um, so children who occupy, uh, occupy the aisle seat are more vulnerable to fallen objects, aisle traffic, and burns from mishandled uh, objects. And then we saw something interesting. Um, lap infants sharing a seat with an adult were more likely to die. And, and this was uh, something that, again, it took a very large sample to, to figure that out. But going back to the original point is there's no good reason, if you can avoid, uh, to, uh, having a child sitting um, on the aisle seat. You know, put the child by the window. You are containing the child. They are away from the passing hot beverages. They are away from the overhead compartment and uh, uh, passenger traffic. And it's more entertaining. So they can look out the window. So travel with children uh, by the window. Um, this is a, um, a question that we asked about uh, the do you know what, where you will have the most prompt medical care if you have a sudden cardiac event? It's a casino. Okay? Casinos have lots of cameras on you, lots of people around you, and uh, AEDs all over the place. Well, planes are like casinos. You have a lot of people around you, you have AEDs, and people will notice if something happens to you right away. So we looked at uh, pediatric in-flight uh, arrests and again, they overwhelmingly happened during international flights, and only half of those were diverted, again, because even though you might be coding a child, you might not have a diversion point. Um, more physicians get called when, when things get real. Uh, and here, you know, you can see uh, that the epidemiology of a, of a cardiac arrest in flight is really no different than that on land. So the rapid access to a responder and equipment uh, is not uh, does not offset the penalty of having delayed definitive medical care. So of uh, 15 cases of uh, CPR, there was only one return of spontaneous circulation, uh, and uh, that patient is alive, and there were 14 patients that upon landing had no return of spontaneous circulation, so they are presumed to be dead. So it's about the same um, uh, rate of return of spontaneous circulation and survivor as we will see in children uh, in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So no advantage of having immediate care, recognition, and access to an AED. In fact, only half the uh, codes had an AED placed uh, uh, on them, which is uh, mind-boggling to me. But uh, when we uh, drill down into who are these patients who are arresting, the vast majority of them, 73%, are lap infants. And of those, about half 
had a pre-existing condition, so these were children with congenital heart defect, uh, a, a child with pulmonary hypertension. There were two children who were traveling for medical care, um, and, and this usually happens in, in medical hubs like the Middle East. And um, so these are conditions that get exacerbated by cabin uh, conditions. And there were about five children who did not have any pre-existing medical condition, and the history was exactly the same. Um, flight, flying east-west or west-east, going through several uh, time zones, there is simulation of nighttime. Um, parent falls asleep with the child um, on their lap, uh, wakes up, the child is apneic, rigid, bad. Uh, so uh, this could be SIDS, which goes back into the um, brainstem respiratory center deregulation uh, with uh, hypoxia, or uh, as those of you who have flown long distance with infants, uh, and, and I did that once flying with my six-month-old to uh, uh, Hong Kong, uh, you become keenly aware that you cannot fall asleep, because if you do, uh, you might roll over this child, you might asphyxiate. So the American Academy of Pediatrics is, is strongly advises against co-sleeping with children, especially in, uh, when you are tired or uh, if you had a beverage, uh, which all that happens in, 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 in many uh, 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 flights. Uh, so, uh, again, that's another example of something that goes up in the air when you are up in the air. You don't secure a child like you do in an automobile. You co-sleep with a child going to uh, you know, China, uh, and that increases the likelihood of uh, a sudden infant death and uh, suffocation. So we published that experience in pediatric critical care a couple of years ago. Uh, and we recently published the uh, in-flight injury uh, study, and we are now looking at uh, a, a more general breakthrough, breakdown on um, uh, just overall pediatric in-flight medical events and, and then moving to some areas of interest uh, uh, like uh, neurological events and seizure exacerbation and so on. So there's, there's, there's a vast and, and, and interesting uh, database that we can ask and try to answer many, many questions. But uh, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, stay over here and just leave you with a couple of recommendations which are good for any traveler and also for your patients who are going to travel. One, stay hydrated. Uh, a lot of uh, the symptoms that occur in flight happen from dehydration. And try to not use a diuretic like alcohol and coffee. If you have a pre-existing condition like anemia, cardiopulmonary disease or pulmonary hypertension, you should really uh, give it some thought as to whether or not uh, you are fit to be exposed to a lower cabin uh, uh, oxygen. Uh, carry on your medications. Uh, never underestimate the fact that uh, uh, there will not be, you know, carvedilol uh, on, on the plane. And if you need carvedilol, you should probably bring it your own. Um, if you can, bring a medical alert bracelet because once you become unconscious, uh, yeah. as it happened to the um, uh, bald man with uh, uh, a midline scar that I took care of, you, you start making, you know, he's unconscious and you're trying to come up with a, a mental image in your head. And maybe he's a terminal cancer patient that uh, um, had a major tumor resection and now he's unconscious and maybe he's dying because he's terminal. Uh, turns out he was not. He just shaves his head because he likes to. And uh, he had uh, uh, an abdominal aortic aneurysm that, uh, that um, uh, had been operated on and he just had a syncopal event. Now it turns out he was also anticoagulated and it was bleeding from his head, which just added a, a, a different perspective. But once he became conscious, it was easy to figure that out. If he had a bracelet, it would not have been a, a problem. Um, oxygen is your friend, so anything that happens up in the air will probably get better with oxygen. Uh, consider not flying with lap infants uh, and securing a seat for your child. Don't put children on the aisle seat and properly restrain them. Uh, and with that, uh, I will stop here, and you know, if you are um, uh, so inclined, I can answer a couple of questions. But thank you for having me.